Hey, welcome to ACF Church, and we're so glad that you're with us watching this message online. And our hope is that it would encourage you to be more like Jesus and walk closely with Him as an apprentice of Christ. And our hope is to give away all of these resources for free as much as possible. It takes a lot of time and energy and people to make that happen. And if you'd like to support the mission of God financially for ACF Church, you can go to acfak.org and you can give there. Now enjoy the Word of God proclaimed. Hey, well, if you're new to ACF, welcome this morning. If you're with us online, we love you. Let's welcome our online family this morning as well. Make sure you let us know where you're watching from uh, in the chat. We'd love to know how to pray for you and just where you're at. You are also part of our family as well. And so really excited to be with you today. This is Palm Sunday. This is a really big day in the church calendar as we kick into this Holy Week. And uh, if you don't know what ACF Church is about, uh, we have this vision for it to be in Alaska as it is in heaven. And our mission is to amplify the grace of Jesus to the churched, the unchurched, and the de-churched. And what we want to see happen is we want to see lost people found, found people grow, growing people trained, and trained people mobilized for the kingdom of God. Amen? So that's that's what we're called to do as a church family. So if you're like, what is this place about? There's a snapshot. So uh, now you're part of the family. You're ready to go. Um, so, and be looking around too. There's not a lot of seats left, and there's people walking around looking for places to sit. And so, if you can squeeze in in the room, look for ways to make room. That would be awesome. And so, today, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, I, I have a question for you Has anybody ever called you passionate? Uh, has anybody ever t- considered you a passionate person? I know, I know some people have called me passionate before. And, and passion can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But the word passion actually comes from a Latin word that means to suffer, which kind of changes the meaning a little bit, doesn't it? Right? Like, oh, look, see, she's so passionate about knitting, right? Is she really suffering for knitting? Um, or, or maybe you're passionate about the show you watch on Netflix, but, you know, you're not really suffering for that thing. The reality is to be passionate is to be willing to suffer. And the reason that we call this The Passion, or maybe you guys watched the movie The Passion of the Christ many years ago, uh, it's called The Passion because we have a God that's passionate about us. And he's not just passionate from a distance. He doesn't give lip service to passion. No, he's a God that from the beginning of time made a plan to suffer and die for humanity. And the Bible says that before the world began, God made that plan. And sure, Jesus showed up to deal with the sin of the world and, 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 and as a way to bridge the gap between God and humanity. Absolutely. But here's what I think. I think God knows, because he's God, that love isn't love unless there's sacrifice. And because God is a God that not only loves but is love, the Bible says at, an, at his essence, God is love because he is a God of love. That he, he knew that if he was going to create this humanity, that for, for love to be love, he would have to sacrifice for humanity. And so if you miss everything else in the sermon today, and you're just going to nod off for a minute, don't miss this. You have a God that is passionate about you. He's a God that wants to sacrifice and did sacrifice for you. That's what it means to have passion. A, a few weeks ago, my little girl, she's 13, she came in and she goes, uh, uh, you know, I, I told her, I'm like, babe, you look really beautiful today. And uh, she responded back, she goes, beauty is pain, dad. <laughs> like, who, who teaches my daughter to say beauty is pain? But she understood this reality that, like, she, <laughs> her point was, this doesn't happen naturally, dad. Like, there's a lot of work that goes into all of this. And, and certainly that's the case. But she understood that, that, that it takes it takes sacrifice, right? There, there's, a, there's a pain, there's a suffering involved for something that you are passionate about. And so uh, you need to know that God is passionate about you. And so as we step into this week that we're walking into, uh, this is a week celebrating and understanding what it means to have a God that suffers and dies for humanity. And one thing I want to I let you know too is today, right after this service, in this room begins 24 hours of prayer. And so we want to start this Holy Week off together by praying together. And so um, every hour on the hour, there will be people hosting prayer in this room. There's going to be some prayer points on the screen. And so you can show up at any hour between now and uh, noontime tomorrow. And all night long, I think I've got like the, the, the 2 a.m. shift. And so you can come hang out with me and my wife, Amanda, if you want to. If you're just like uh, awake late at night or whatever, come to the church building and just pray with us. We're going to be praying for our community, praying for God to to work in this week, really preparing our hearts to embrace the reality 
of the suffering servant Jesus and also him as the resurrected king. And, and we, I know I need to do that. I need to prepare my heart to embrace that reality as we move towards Good Friday and toward Easter. And so make sure you uh, are a part of that this week. If you have a Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 21. And we're going to start off by reading what's known as the triumphant entry of Jesus. This is the pag- passage where Jesus uh, comes into Jerusalem. And this sets in motion the things that would happen on Good Friday. So this is Matthew 21, verse 1. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Unite, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So the history of this is that 400 years prior to this, the prophet Zechariah had this prophecy of the Messiah showing up in this way, and Jesus is the fulfillment of every prophecy about the Messiah. And I want to encourage you, maybe go Google this later on tonight, and just study prophecies of the Messiah and how Jesus fulfilled them. And it is absolutely incredible, the way that Jesus was literally spoken about hundreds of years before he arrived on earth. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of all of this prophecy as he arrives to the people in this way. Verse 6 says, The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. These are palm branches. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna literally means God save us. To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. You see, these people were in a moment in history where they were waiting on a revolution. And they were waiting for a political leader to show up and overthrow the Roman Empire and really set these people free once again. And Jesus arrives to that type of political climate. And and, and sure, he's bringing a revolution, but not the kind that they want or the kind that they think they need. Jesus is going to bring a revolution of the heart to these people. And he shows up to these people, and and he comes in the city through uh, the east gate of Jerusalem. That's actually the gate that is uh, behind me. Um, This is current day. And if you're like, that does not look like a gate. Yes, they put bricks over the gates, but that would have been a a door that could have been opened and Jesus would have come into the east gate of Jerusalem. Also, this gate was known as the mercy gate. So interestingly enough, Jesus comes into Jerusalem through the mercy gate on a donkey. And it looks like a coronation ceremony, right? It looks like a, a new king is coming into town. It's a huge crowd of people. This would have been Passover week. And so the, the city would have, would have swelled to over a million people in the community, and they're all gathering around Jesus. They lay down palm branches, and these branches were actually a symbol of nationalistic pride. It would be like laying down American flags before Jesus. And so you can see the political overtones of what's happening here in this moment. And then this Jesus comes in on a donkey, right? And a donkey was a symbol of service, a symbol of humility, a symbol of suffering, and a symbol of peace. And uh, donkeys are just weird animals too, right? Like, it kind of seems like a weird thing to to ride into a city, but actually uh, Jewish monarchs would ride on donkeys. And so uh, there was a lot of prestige and honor in what Jesus was doing. And he also rides in on the 10th day of the month. This also would have been the day that families in the city would have been choosing a lamb to sacrifice for the Passover meal. And so um, think of all these connections that are being made. Jesus, the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world, comes into the city on the 10th day of the month, fulfilling all of the prophecy that was spoken about the Messiah. And it's a party. I, I mean, I just want you to imagine a massive explosion of people cheering and screaming for Jesus as he comes in to the city. And they had seen similar entrances like this before. This isn't the first time that they'd seen this, but not from Jesus, probably actually from Pilate. 
And if you don't know, Pilate was actually the Roman governor of that time in history. And when Pilate would enter the city, he wouldn't come through the east gate, which was the oldest gate. He would come through the west gate, which was a place that was newer and and well-built and of prestige. And when Pilate would show up, it would be a party as well. Now, I was reading, some scholars actually believe that Pilate may have been arriving the same day as Jesus to the city. And we don't know this for sure, but I want you to imagine this reality that there are two parades happening at the same time. Like two parties happening at the same time, except for everybody's at Jesus' party. Everybody's showing up to Jesus' party. And when Pilate would show up to the city, it would be different. He wouldn't ride on a donkey, right? He'd ride on a horse. They'd be covered in in armor, in leather, and ready for battle, right? He himself would be wearing armor and ready for battle. Instead of an entourage of fishermen and women, he'd be followed by an army of people, of men wearing armor, ready to fight. And instead of humility and suffering, he would show up to the city to show power and control, you would ride into the city as a, as a leader to show like, hey, I'm the one that's in charge. Submit to my leadership. And when Pilate would enter the city, the people would say something. They would say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is Pilate who comes in the name of Lord Caesar. But on this particular day, Jesus comes into the other gate. And he has this crowd of people screaming, and they scream what they know to scream. They sing, they scream, blessed is he, Jesus, who comes in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And I want you to imagine the political tension that would have existed anyway at this moment, and and just what what was happening between Jesus and the religious leaders and the government at that point as he's stirring up these riots around town, Right? Imagine all of this happening at this moment. And so what was just, I think, some tension, I believe, began to be a fever pitch in the community. And in this community, there were three groups of people watching this um, entry of Jesus. Uh, You'd see probably the people that were the Jews in Jerusalem. You'd have uh, a crowd from Galilee traveling with him. And then probably the people that saw Lazarus raised from the dead. And if you know the story, this is really what begins all of this, is that Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and the crowds go wild, right? Because it turns out when somebody you know dies and then comes back to life, people are really interested in you. And the crowds start to follow Jesus around. They're like, what's up with this guy? Like, we saw he was dead, and then he came back to life. And up to this point, things have been different for Jesus, I mean, he would, he, would, he would perform a miracle. He would heal somebody, but remember what he'd say? He'd be like, hey, shh, shh, don't tell anyone. Now's not my time. And he just kept saying, now's not the time. The time is not right, and, but now he is like, the time's right. This is the moment of history. Jesus, he, he, he knows the timing is right for him to show himself as the one true king of the world. And imagine the contrast between Sunday and Friday. So we come to Good Friday, which Good Friday at ACF has become one of my favorite services because it prepares us really for the celebration of Easter. But the tone of, of Palm Sunday is completely the opposite of the tone of Good Friday. A man goes from being followed by crowds of people, worshipped like a king, to being crucified on a cross, right? All of a sudden, their hosanna turns to hatred. In just a few days. I think Jesus is showing them some things, and he wants to draw a stark contrast between what they were going to see and what was going to come on Friday. And then he moves forward, and he he cleanses the temple, right? We know that he goes into the temple, and the religious leaders are actually abusing people. Uh, They're they're using uh, their their, their faith, really, to leverage against them uh, to, to make money, And so Jesus arrives, and he's like, you have made my temple a den of robbers, right? You are literally robbing from people, and we know that Jesus flips over the tables, right? Somebody ticked off Jesus when he starts flipping over tables. And and a lot of people have used this moment as a way to defend violence, but that's, we don't read that Jesus hit anybody with the tables, right? Uh, This is not like WWF or something like that. It's just, we read that he flipped over tables, and we know that that he had a whip, and a whip would be a very loud noise, certainly, like he was driving people out with the whip. We don't read that he actually hit people with it. And so this wasn't 
a moment of violence, but Jesus had a righteous indignation that the religious would abuse those that God loves. And you can imagine the anger. Like Jesus just messed up their meal ticket, right? Jesus just messed up their opportunity to make money on people, and they were enraged, right? Here's what you know. If you want to upset the religious leaders, then you need to threaten their control and their power. And that's, that's what's going on here, is he threatens control and power, right? Which we got to look at religious leaders today. If control and power are what drive, drives us, we probably don't look like Jesus. We look like the Pharisees, right? And so he, he upsets the religious leaders by threatening their control and their power, right? It flips over the tables. And then the religious leaders look at him and they're like, by what authority do you do what you do and say what you say? Like, in other words, who do you think you are? Is what they said to Jesus. And I, I love how uh, Jesus responds to them. He never tells people the answer. He just tells them a story. He's essentially like, you're going to figure it out. But I'm going to give you a story as an example. He says in Matthew 21, 28, He says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? So they thought for a second and they said, the first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, (laughs) the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. You could have heard a pin drop. He is looking at the religious elite, and he's like, you know what? You're going to miss out on the kingdom of God, but you know who's going to make it? The tax collectors and the prostitutes. The people who you ridicule, those that you see as least in the community, they're going to make it into the kingdom of God, and you're going to miss it, is what Jesus is telling them. I think he's saying this, it gains you nothing to pay lip service to the king. It gains you nothing to pay lip service to the king. Uh, What is lip service? I don't know if you've heard that term before. Lip service is simply to say one thing and do another. It's, It's hypocrisy, right? Lip service is, oh, I'm so passionate about this. And yet, an unwillingness to suffer for it. That's lip service. For me, that's, that's like uh, getting in shape. I pay lip service to getting in shape. I say, oh man, I really want to get in shape and go to the gym. And, and what I really mean by that is I just want another taco. That's what I mean by that. Because <laughs> if you look at my life, you, look, you would see I'm inconsistent at the gym. I want to get in better shape, but I'm paying lip service to it. Where in your life are you paying lip service to something? Can you think of anything in your life that you pay lip service to? Imagine this crowd of people, right? The crowd of people is gathering around Jesus. They are celebrating him as as their savior, right? Like he is going to rescue us out of the hands of Rome. He is the king. And imagine if you ask them, hey, would you ever walk away from Jesus? They'd be like, no, not us. No, of course not. Let's stick with Jesus forever, right? Jesus goes on to be even more clear about who he is in Matthew 21. He actually quotes from Psalm 118 when he says this. He says, Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And if you know anything about building, you know that the cornerstone of a building is the most important stone in the building. It actually sets the course for all of the other stones in the structure. If the cornerstone is off, the whole building is off. And Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. He's the cornerstone of the world. And he's saying, hey, the the very one that is the cornerstone of all things, the one that that drives all things and, and is over all things, me, he's referring to himself, you are missing it. You're miss you're literally throwing me like a like a like a a cornerstone into the pile of rubble. You're throwing me out. You're missing who I am. So this big show in all of this, Jesus is drawing such a sharp contrast, again, between Sunday and Friday. And I think he wants to make a huge point, and he wants to challenge them with this reality that you have two decisions when it comes to Jesus. There are only two options when it comes to Jesus. You can either crown him or kill him. And this is what the people will do, is they will make this decision to crown him 
or to kill him. There ain't no friends with benefits when it comes to Jesus, right? You don't, you don't say like, oh, I, I love you, Jesus. I just want the benefits of Jesus and then live like you don't follow him at all. And one thing we know about that city is that Jesus was completely polarizing. You either loved or hated Jesus. There was no middle ground. We tend to think I can have a middle ground with Jesus. There is no middle ground option. There's no option three when it comes to Jesus. You can't say like, well, I kind of like Jesus. Nobody kind of likes Jesus. You either crown him or you kill him. And so we have the same decision to make. Who will you serve in this life? Are you crowning or killing Jesus? When Paul talks about the sin in our lives, when we live in unrepentant sin, he talks about it like we are crucifying Christ all over again. That's what he says. He says, when you live in unrepentant sin and you just say, I'm not going to do what God calls me to do, I am literally placing Jesus on the cross. We choose to crown or kill Jesus every single day of our life. So who's your king? Who do you follow? If you know the story of Joshua, at the end of his life, he tells all the people, you need to choose who you serve. Like, it's time to choose the one that you serve. And then remember what he says? He says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Do you have the plaque next to your keys at the house somewhere? Like, I know somebody's got the plaque. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Like, that's, that's easy to put on the wall. It's a lot harder to live, isn't it? I'll tell you this, um, church, it's not going to get easier to be a Christian. It's going to get harder. Do you know that? Like, even right now in America, it's pretty easy to say we're Christians. Um, Somebody at the supermarket later today asked me, like, hey, do you go to church somewhere? It'd be easy for me to say, yeah, I'm I'm part of ACF. I'm a a Christian. You know, there's there's not a whole lot of backlash from that. I would say in our society today, Christianity is just sort of like an annoyance, kind of a fly in the ointment when it comes to certain things, because, you know, Christians stand up and we're like, hey, I don't think that's going to lead to human flourishing, and oh, I, don't, I don't really think that that's the best way to live, or this is what's best for society, and so we kind of push up against a certain crowd of people, so we kind of annoy them, but it is not going to get easier to be a Christian, and we will all have to make a decision as to who we serve, and so I'll ask you, like, what is your pain tolerance when it comes to following Jesus? See, I think this is really the level of your passion. The degree to, to which you're willing to suffer for Christ is the same degree to which your love is actually authentic. And that's the reality. That's, that's the reality of Jesus. He's willing to die for humanity. That's why his love is perfect. But a lot of us, we're like, no, I'm so passionate about Jesus. But man, take away the crowd. Take away the music. Take away Sunday morning service. And if there's nothing left of your faith, And if there's not sacrifice left in your life, then we have to ask ourselves, do we really love Jesus? See, Palm Sunday, this is a tipping point. I mean, he's forcing people to reconcile what they think they believe with what they actually believe. What they think is their king and what actually is their king. And so here's a question. When Jesus gets between you and your desires, who wins? Who wins? When's the last time you wanted something, Jesus wanted something else, and you said you win? There, I'll tell you, like, this is hard in all of our lives, but this is going to happen. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's going to happen to you every single day. You're going to desire something, and Jesus is going to be like, that's not, that's not what I want for you. And then you're going to have to make a decision. And for some of us, what we do is like, uh, same thing as in the Bible. You read something in the Bible, and the Bible says something. We're like, oh, that doesn't, I don't like that. I'd rather I didn't read that. And you have options, right? You have options. You, you can go, okay, well, I'm going to find somebody who agrees with me, who interprets this text to mean what I hope it means. Or you go, well, maybe I can find a different Bible translation to support what I want to believe. And just trust me, like, if you Google enough, you can find an article written by somebody to support anything you want to believe, okay? So if that's you, if you're like, I just want to believe what I want to believe, then you can find somebody to affirm your belief. But but I want you to ask the question, when Jesus gets between you and your desires, who wins? Like when your opinion collides with God's opinion, who wins? The answer should be, change your opinion. But what it often is, is I hope I can change God's opinion. I hope I can can get what I want and, and actually follow Jesus at the same time. And this is a decision, once again, do we crown Jesus or kill him? Do we lift him up and say, you are king? I'm going to crown you today by saying, I don't desire this Christ or this is something that maybe I don't want for my life or something you're asking me to do that I don't want to do but I'm going to do it because I want to crown you king of my life. 
or we can crucify him all over again. We are always either crowning or killing Jesus. I want you to know this too. Um, Sometimes we think Jesus is stealing our life from us. We're actually getting into a series right after Easter that's all about the better life that God is calling us into. And so sometimes when Jesus doesn't want something for us or, man, there's like a boundary drawn, we go, man, God, you're taking something from me. But I want to promise you something. If If Jesus is getting between you and your desire, then that desire is actually trying to kill you. Does that make sense? Like, Jesus isn't trying to steal life from us. The Bible says he wants to give it to us in the full, right? So if Jesus is like, no, I don't want you to do that, that means that is trying to to kill you, to take something from you, right? Like, I saw this growing up with my mom in the car, right? So, like, we would drive down the road, and then, like, the the light would turn red at the last minute, and she'd slam on the brakes. And every mom knows what this looks like when there's a kid in the front seat. What do you do? Bam! Right? Like, just naturally, you throw the arm out, without even thinking that's your reflex, is to get between someone you love and the thing that wants to hurt them, in that case, the dashboard, right? And put my arm between my child and the dashboard because I love them. You need to know this is Jesus' natural reaction to you, is that he always wants to get between you and the thing that wants to kill you. And do you know that when he got on a cross, that's what he was doing? Is that he was standing between you and your sin. He was standing in the gap, taking your sin upon himself. The sin that wants to destroy you, Jesus said, I want to protect you. I want to stand in the way of the things that want to destroy you. You see, in the end, I think we have to decide who we serve. Is that king worth following? Is that that king worth sacrificing for? And what does it really mean to follow that king? Luke 9.23 says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I was reading that this week and I was like, what if Jesus actually meant that? What if he actually meant that there's a sacrifice to be made? That if we actually want to follow Jesus, which we say that, right? To be a disciple means to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. What did Jesus do at the end of his life? He got on a cross. We say, well, I want all of the rest of Jesus' life, but not that part right? I want the, like, fishing with his friends part, doing the miracles part. Like, I want Palm Sunday, Jesus. I do not want Good Friday, Jesus. And so a lot of you are stuck still on Palm Sunday. But the week continues, right? And a lot of us, if we're honest, the question is, what parade would we go to? If there were two parades in the city, one was Pilate and one was Jesus, which parade would you go to? A lot of people would be attracted to Pilate. And at the same time, we also might find ourselves in the crowd following Jesus, yet not really knowing what it meant to really follow him. I want you to think about why you came to church today. If you're part of ACF, if you're like, ACF's my church family, okay, that's great. Why did you choose ACF? And, and, and I want you to think about how people choose a church in today's world. If you ask somebody like, hey, why do you go to ACF? The answers are almost always the same. It's like, man, the kids' ministry is awesome, right? Like, uh, their youth ministry is super great. Man, it's just great for for middle schoolers and high schoolers. College ministry is great. Um, They do great things for the community. That's really cool. And all my friends hear about it. And they're like, man, that's a great church that serves the community. Or, man, have you heard the band? Oh, the band is so good, which the band is really good. I love our band. They're amazing. Like, the music's great. The worship's great. I want you to think about the theme of all of those things. What's at the center of all of them? You are. I am. Like, we are at the center of why we choose a church. And and if, if you choose a church based on those things, it says something about who you serve, doesn't it? Because ultimately, when it comes to picking a church family, I want you to think about this. When it comes to picking a church, the the question isn't what can they give me? The question is, how can I give of myself? That's really, really the question. Like, and, and I want you to know this. This is so important for you if you're um, maybe only going to be in Alaska for a few more years or you're military and you're going to move. If you choose a church based on its amenities and then you move to a community with a church uh, or churches that have fewer amenities, your faith will struggle. And I've seen this over and over again. 
But if you show up to a church and you say, I am here because there's a mission that's worth fighting for, I'm here to give of myself, how can I serve the mission? Then you can go to a church with a community with a big church, a small church, lots of great ministries, very few ministries, and your faith will thrive. Because you're a servant. Because you're here to give of yourself, right? And so it's, it's so important. Like, why do you choose a church home? In the end, you have to ask yourself, who do I serve? One of our values as a church family is this. We are not consumers. We are contributors. So that's, that's how you know. That's how you know from crossing over from, like, ACF being a church that you attend to being your church is when you move from consumer to contributor. When you move from showing up to going, what can they do for me? And you go, like, how can I be a part of the mission? And again, these are all just signs in our lives of what we are actually about. And I was just thinking this week, you know, Jesus enters the city, and the crowds are cheering, Jesus, right? And I can imagine, like, some of us might be in that crowd. And if you know the story, just right before this moment, Jesus, he looks out into Jerusalem, and uh, he's just weeping. And, And this really struck me this week, I'd never really noticed this, like, Jesus was weeping before his parade, isn't that strange to you? Like, like, if you knew today at church, everybody is going to lift you up on their shoulders and be like, Sarah, Sarah, you know, like lifting you up. There's probably Sarah here, like it's you. Uh, like lift you up and celebrate you. Would you be coming into church and just like, oh, crying in tears, right? You'd probably be celebrating. You'd be excited. Like today's my day. I'm going to be lifted up like a, like, like a king or a queen at church. Well, Jesus, before he rides into the city, is weeping over Jerusalem. There's another time where Jesus is weeping, and he speaks these words. He's like, oh, that I would gather you together like, like chicks under the wings. He t- that's how he talks about that, like, 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 like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. I wish I could just gather my people together. Oh, Jerusalem, he's grieving over the reality that he's going to come into the city, and the people will scream his name with their mouths, yet they will forsake him in their hearts. And it made me wonder, like, the things that we think are celebration. Like, would Jesus weep over ACF Church? Would Jesus weep over our Easter gathering? Would Jesus weep over you or me? As we come in here and we lift our hands, or we might sing a little bit, or we might move around a little bit during the worship, we listen to a sermon, and then we leave here and we check the box, and we think, oh, that was a win. Was it? Because once again, passion means I am willing to give of my life. I am willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. What's your threshold for pain when it comes to the gospel? What are you willing to do to follow Jesus and show your deep love for him? Jesus weeps for Jerusalem. The question is, would he weep for you? Would he weep for me? There's a few things I think that we can do when it comes to to Jesus entering the city. Three responses, if you want to write these down. The first is this, see the king, and that's to make Jesus your Lord. That's the first thing. If you're here today and you're like, yep, that's me. I've been paying lip service to Jesus for a long time. Then then today is a beautiful invitation to to make him the Lord of your life. Do you know there's a difference between making Jesus your Savior and making him your Lord? There's a lot of people that love the idea of getting saved that don't really want to make Jesus the Lord of their lives. But actually, they, they come together. Do you know that? Salvation comes when you make him the Lord of your life. And so to see Jesus for who he is is to crown him. Is to give him authority, is to make him the Lord of your life. I want you to think about the fact that they, Jesus comes into the city and it's all stirred up, right? There's crowds of people just screaming his name. The city is going crazy because of the presence of Jesus in the city. You see, that's how you know people have made Jesus their Lord, because the city gets stirred up. Does that make sense? Like, do you know that Eagle River should be stirred up by your presence? By my presence? That's how you know that the presence of Jesus is here and alive in people is that the city is stirred up. And also, Jesus, when he shows up, it polarizes the city. You either love him or you hate him. You crown him or you kill him. There's no third option. And so if we are the presence of Jesus in our city, we will experience the same. What nobody did was just like Jesus. You don't just like Jesus. You either love him or you hate him. But what's the focus of most of our lives? To be liked, right? 
We just want to be liked. And so because of that, I think we miss out on the things that God calls us to. Uh, Paul talks about how when, when Jesus shows up, or the presence of Jesus, it's like an aroma. It's kind of interesting. That's the language. He, it's like an aroma to the community. He says this in 2 Corinthians 2.15. He says, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. In other words, God sorts people out. That's not your job. You're just the aroma of Christ. Like, it's kind of, it's strange language, but it's like when you enter a room, people are like, I smell Jesus, right? It's like something smells like Jesus. I don't know what the smell of Jesus is, but somehow when you enter the room, people are like, it smells like Jesus. But listen, it continues on. It says, to the one, we are an aroma that brings death, and to the other, an aroma that brings life. And so to some people in the room, when they smell Jesus, they're like, oh, I want some of that. I don't know what that is, but I want some of that. Other people are like, get me out of here. Like some of you are in the room today and you're hearing about Jesus and your skin is crawling. That's what that is. And it says more about your receptivity to the gospel than it does about Jesus. It's not the aroma. It's not the person. It's not Christ himself that that says something about. It's your willingness to receive it. To one person, they're like, that smells like hope. That seems like peace. That seems like everything I need. When they encounter you, they encounter those things and they want it. To others, they go, I want nothing to do with it. Because that sounds like surrender and I'm the God of my own life. That sounds like wanting a king and everybody knows that I'm king. And so to that person, it's the aroma of death. So the first step is to see the king, to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, to choose where your allegiances lie. Some of you would say, man, I'm loyal to Jesus, but you know your loyalty isn't loyalty till it's tested. So once again, when your loyalty is tested, when your desires collide with Christ's desires, who wins? And that's how you know who your Lord is. The second thing is this, we want to share the king. That means to, to tell your story. In, uh, in churchy terms, we use, the, we use the word testimony. Testimony, which, which is just like, it's a story of God at work in our lives. That's what it means to have a testimony. And so in this moment, everybody told the story of the arrival of Jesus. Like he stirred up the community. It was trending on Twitter, right? More than Elon Musk is right now. Like it was all about Jesus. Because when Jesus shows up in someone's life in a real way, they talk about him. Like, I love some of you, like, this is why I love brand new believers, that, man, you get saved, and you won't shut up about Jesus. I mean, everywhere you go, I mean, you're annoying friends left and right, but they're like, okay, it's a Jesus conversation again. But, like, you can't help but talk about Jesus, help talk about what God's doing in your church family. I mean, you've already invited 20 people to Easter, right? And you're coming back, and you're like, give me more cards. You will not be quiet. And it's not... It's not because you're just a recruiter. It's because God has changed your heart in such a powerful way that you can't help but tell your story. Here's my question. If you can stay silent about what Christ has done in your life, has he really done it? Have you allowed him to do it? If you're like, yeah, I can close my lips about that. If you're like, yeah, I'm not willing to threaten the relationship. You know, like, like if that's you, is it really your story? So share the king. Tell your story. Um, could you ask, pass me some of these little cards right here? On your seat, would you guys find your, it's the little cards there, yeah. Would you guys find your invite cards? Hey, you're probably sitting on them somewhere real quick. Um, if you want to find these, just take a look at this. There, we've, we've given you five invite cards. And the in invitation to you is to find five friends that wouldn't typically attend church and invite them to Easter. So we're a week out from Easter at Eagle River High School, and we're going we're gonna to pack the house. I'm really excited about it. And we're going to share the good news of Jesus with our whole city. It's going to be awesome. And so you have friends that I don't have, and you have influences that the person next to you doesn't have. And I want you to get rid of every one of these cards this week. Just give these away, not to one person, to five different people. It doesn't count if you give them all to one person. Give them away to five different people. Invite people to Easter. And if they're like, why would you invite me to do this? You get a chance to share your story because God's changed my life. And I think he might want to change yours. It's really, really that simple, you guys. And so invite your friends to Easter. Share the story of God in your life. And the third thing that I think we can do when it comes to the arrival of Jesus is this, to show the king. And the way that we're doing that on Easter is getting baptized. 
And so we are, we, we have this opportunity, it's incredible, on Easter Sunday, which I can't think of a better day to get, Easter, uh, get baptized than on Easter Sunday. The day of the resurrection of Christ, right? We're celebrating Jesus is alive. What better day to get baptized? Because that's what baptism is. Do you know that? Baptism is simply a symbol of your death and resurrection in Christ Jesus. And so it's going to be the perfect day to get baptized. And if, if you're wondering, like, here's our dream that we've been praying for since we decided to do this, is that by the end of Easter Sunday, there isn't one Christian in the room who says, I'm a follower of Jesus, but has not been baptized. Because here's what I know. I know in a room like this today, and those who are watching us online, that there's a crowd of you who are followers of Jesus, but you've never taken the step of baptism. And you've got a lot of reasons, right? You've got reasons why you haven't done it. So I want to talk about a few of those reasons. First, here's some reasons that people don't get baptized. First, fear of crowds. Come on, like, you hate crowds. And, and honestly, like, I get nervous every time I get up here to preach to you. So just so you know, um, I'm uncomfortable too, uh, if that makes you feel any better. But some of you are just uncomfortable about the crowd. But here, here's, here's what you need to know, is that baptism isn't about the crowd. Like, it's, it's not about those, like, it's about honoring God. And so sometimes just, just the crowd makes us nervous. Here's what you need to know. We're not going to give you a speech. We're not going to hand you a mic and shove a mic in your face. And we will make it absolutely seamless for you to get baptized. Don't allow fear to keep you from baptism. The next is this. Some of you are waiting on an Instagram moment. And I know this to be the case because I hear it all the time. It's like, well, I want to get baptized and the weather's got to be perfect and it's got to be like out in the Eagle River, which I think is like 20 below anyway. So it's got to be in the river and it should be like an eagle flying in the background and slow motion, like hair coming up out of the water and the picture will be taken at the right time and it's going to look so good on my Instagram page, right? Like, like you're waiting on the perfect moment. And again, where do your thoughts center around when it comes to baptism? All of that's just about you, Right? I mean, in the end, what's, here's what's beautiful about getting baptized on Easter is that there may never be a time with that many people in the room who will get to witness the transformational work of Christ in your life. I mean, you may never get to share your verbal story with that many people ever again in your entire life, but on Easter, you get to do it in a physical way through baptism, and everybody gets to see it. So it's an incredible opportunity. It's not about the Instagram moment. I love that, you know, like in the book of Acts, there's a, he's known as the Ethiopian eunuch. And uh, it, it's this royal man. He's, he's in this chariot. He's, he's looking at the scriptures, and he starts asking questions of Philip. And then all of a sudden, like, the gospel makes sense to him. And he looks at this muddy puddle of water, and he says, what's keeping me from getting baptized? I'll just tell you, I've never seen that on Instagram. Never seen somebody in a muddy puddle of water getting baptized. Maybe we should. But for, for him, he's like, my life's been transformed. What's keeping me from getting baptized? So bam, he just gets baptized. Some of you are dealing with feelings of unworthiness. Can I tell you that the point of baptism is that you're unworthy? That's the point. And I am too. Like, if you feel unworthy to get baptized, you should get baptized. If you feel worthy to get baptized, I want to encourage you not to get baptized. Does that make sense? So if you're like, man, I just feel really like I got some sin in my life and some things that I still need God to work on, that's actually a great time to get baptized. This is kind of a strange one. Uh, not the right container. We, do, we use like a cattle tank from uh, AIH or something like that. Like it's just a, it's all it is, is just a metal cattle tank. Some of you are like, it should be the Nile or it should be like, some other more beautiful, it's, it's just, it's, uh, it's water and it's a tank. It doesn't really matter. The container's not the point, right? Some of you think it's been too long. Can I just tell you, it's never too late to be obedient to Jesus. It is never too late to do the right thing. Some of you feel like it's just been too, it's why I love seeing people in their 70s get baptized at ACF Church. We've seen that many times. Because I feel like there's some things coming against a 70-year-old that aren't coming against a 20-year-old, right? There's just different struggles. And for a 70-year-old, it's like somebody's going to think, shouldn't she have done that at this point? You know, like, but you got to work through that because it's not about that fear, right? It's about declaring Christ's goodness in your life. This is an interesting one. Um, some of you have been baptized as infants. And uh, this, is a, this is a struggle for some people. And here's what you need to know is that if you grew up and you were baptized as an infant, 
we see that as more of a dedication than a declaration. Does that make sense? So, like, you might have been baptized as a child, and your parents were saying, man, we want to raise this person um, in, in, in the Lord, and so we want to make sure that they, this, this, this child gets baptized. But you had no say in the matter, right? You just got baptized. And so what a lot of people want to do is they want to get baptized as an adult and say, hey, I want to make the decision for me. I want to decide to follow Jesus for me and let the world know that I was dead and now I'm alive in Christ. And so I would just encourage you to follow your conscience, but we have a lot of people who get baptized as adults, who are baptized as infants, who want to just make that declaration on their own. And the last thing that I think people have as a challenge is this. They just see baptism as optional. They see it as like, a, like an extra add-on. But you need to know this in the first century, when you would get saved, you would then get baptized. They were connected at the hip. The Bible's full of that. Jesus says, go into the nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It always was connected. Acts 2.38, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, most of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? It's not most of you. It's all of you, Right? Repent and be baptized, every single one of you. It's a, it's a call of obedience. It, it's, it's not an optional thing for us. And, so we, and, and in the end, here's the deal. You might do it, do it out of obedience to God, and God might use that in miraculous ways. We see this over and over again. And so I want to invite you to take that step here today. If you want to grab your action card off of your seat and uh, just pick a next step here today, we'd love to be praying for you. Maybe you just need to begin a relationship with Jesus. And if that's you, here's the deal. You don't need to follow Jesus alone. You don't need to figure it out on your own. We've actually got some resources for you uh, to give you to take some next steps. And so make sure you check that box and drop that in the basket on the way out. And we'd love to follow up with you on that. Maybe you just need prayer this week because you've been paying lip service to God. So for you, maybe, maybe that's your next step is just start getting prayed for and acknowledge and confess that. Maybe you need courage to tell your story. Is that you today? And last, maybe you're here today and you're like, I, I need to get baptized. This is, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. So if that's you, just check that box, put your information. Somebody will follow up with you this week and make sure there's a sign-up uh, going around online that you can get signed up for. Uh, we're also allowing people on Easter Sunday. If, uh, if people just decide that day to get baptized, we'll have everything they need to get baptized that day as well. I'm so excited, church, about what's to come. God's going to do great things this Holy Week. Would you stand up? I want to pray for us. We'll move on and worship today. Father, thank you for the church. God, thanks for the challenge that you gave those people and are giving us today to choose who we will serve. God, we want to acknowledge that it's so easy to pay lip service to the king. It's so easy to lift our hands on Sunday and live like you don't exist on Monday. So Father, we confess that wherever that is in our lives, God, wherever it is that we have not given in to you and seen that your way is always better. I pray we confess that to you today and that we would crown you Lord of every part of our lives. Father, forgive us. Give us courage. God, as we share our story this week, as we invite friends to Easter, God, I pray that we'd have courage to do that. I pray you'd raise our threshold for suffering, Father. In so many ways, we are fearful. Yet, God, I pray you give us a kingdom perspective on our lives. We love you. We pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thanks for watching this message from ACF Church. Uh, we hope it's encouraged you and challenged you to be more like Jesus and to walk with him in a closer and more profound way. If you'd like to give to the mission of ACF Church, you can do so at the link on the screen or at acfak.org. We love you and we'll see you next week.